This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Among the Osmot people of New Guinea, there exists a way of life that has remained unchanged since the Stone Age. In 1961, it drew the attention of a restless young man named Michael Rockefeller. For the primitive Osmot tribes, life is a continual interaction of ghosts, spirits, and magic. Tribal warfare is commonplace and expected. Death must be met with revenge. Among these fierce aboriginal men, Michael Rockefeller traveled to study and learn. In their midst, he disappeared and was never seen again. Harvard University, June 1960. For Governor and Mrs. Nelson Rockefeller, it was a special emotional moment. Their youngest son, Michael, had graduated with honors. Ahead of him lay a life filled with promise and great opportunity. At 22, Michael Rockefeller was the most outgoing and restless of the governor's three sons and two daughters. He loved travel and people, and within six months, he was half a world away in the remote highlands of Dutch New Guinea. Michael had joined an anthropological expedition to study and record a Stone Age tribe called the Dani. Sensitive and enthusiastic, he took special pleasure in his work. For six months, Michael served as the expedition's sound man and still photographer. When his work was over, he was drawn to another part of New Guinea, to a people called the Osmot. Along the coast and in the winding tidal rivers of southern New Guinea, the primitive Osmot tribes lived as they had since primeval times. Michael Rockefeller traveled throughout the region, fascinated by the Osmot culture and way of life. In his journal, Rockefeller wrote, The Osmot is equal to my wildest dreams. It is a land of great winding rivers, jungle, and mud. Literally nothing else. The people have lived for centuries on little besides the pulp of the sago palm and fish. Some remote areas are still headhunting. A keen observer and gifted photographer, Michael carefully documented Osmot life. In the Osmot people, Michael sensed the nobility that he admired and compassionately recorded. The word Osmot means tree people, and indeed Osmot culture depends almost totally on trees for food, shelter, for their canoes, and for their art. The Osmot even believe themselves to be descended from trees. Their mythology tells of a great magician who wandered their uninhabited land. Out of loneliness, he carved human figures from mangrove wood. He beat softly on a drum and brought the figures to life. Thus, the Osmot came to be. The Osmot still believe that their spirits reside in trees. The felling of a mangrove tree begins an ancient ritual that intermingles art and violence. Before the cut mangrove trunk can enter the village, Osmot women pelt it with mud, exorcising any evil spirits that may still live inside. Once the mangrove is cleansed of demons, the intricate carving begins. Shaped into the head of dead ancestors and kinsmen, 
the carving becomes a vital link between the material and spiritual worlds. For the Osmot, natural death does not exist. Only evil spirits and enemies account for the passing of life. The finished carving becomes a pledge to the dead that their spirits will be revenged. The beauty of Osmot art completely captivated Michael Rockefeller. In his journal, Rockefeller wrote, The key to my fascination with the Osmot is the wood carving. The sculpture which the people here produce is some of the most extraordinary work in the primitive world. Full of youthful enthusiasm, Michael Rockefeller began collecting Osmot art. As he journeyed from village to village, Michael observed the subtle details of Osmot life. He wrote, the rowers placed little effort behind their strokes, allowing the outflowing tide to carry the prows easily along. For weeks, Michael traveled through Osmot territory, often accompanied by missionaries and anthropologists. Gradually, he began to amass a wide collection of carvings. He dreamed of an exhibit that would pay tribute to the Osmot's amazing creativity. On November 18, 1961, Michael Rockefeller embarked on a native catamaran for a village up the coast. With him was Dutch anthropologist René Wassing and two native guides. The purpose of the trip was to pick up carvings for which Michael already had bartered. The makeshift catamaran was powered by only a single outboard motor. Michael had been warned of dangerous, unpredictable currents. At the mouth of the Islandon River, a massive tidal surge suddenly drowned the motor and capsized the boat. The natives swam for help. Rockefeller and Wassing clung to the boat, hopelessly adrift. After a night in the water, fearing the natives had failed, Michael decided to go for help himself. Using two empty gasoline cans for extra buoyancy, he swam for shore. Michael Rockefeller and Rene Wassing didn't know it, but their native guides had made it back to land. The closest village was only 11 miles away. Yet, in the thick jungle and deep mud of the Osmot coast, the trek for help took nearly a day. When Dutch authorities finally learned of the accident, a full-scale search was launched immediately. Searchers combed over coastal rivers and seemingly endless spans of dense jungle shoreline. The region below was hostile and forbidding. The coastline was a muddy swamp with estuaries where crocodiles prowled. Beyond lay spongy tangles of sago palms and mangroves, alive with poisonous snakes, scorpions, and swarms of mosquitoes. The Osmot had named their home the Land of Lapping Death. Suddenly, a miracle. A flying boat had found Rene Wassing, still clinging to the capsized catamaran more than 20 miles out to sea. Stunned and exhausted, Wassing told reporters of the ordeal. He had tried unsuccessfully to dissuade Michael from attempting the swim to shore. Michael's last words were, I think I can make it. Now the massive search efforts concentrated on Michael. The news that his son was lost had taken three days to reach Governor Rockefeller. Stunned and disoriented, he tried his best to deal with an endless onslaught of questions. I'm headed out there. Hopefully I'll find him before we get there, but to be there uh, when they do find him, so if there's anything I can do, I will. In New Guinea, the news was not good. No trace of Michael had yet been found. For the native Osmot, the spectacle of the search was awesome and overwhelming. They had never seen anything like it. 
Several more days of searching yielded nothing. A pale and haggard father had almost given up hope. Then, the first clue. The red gasoline can that Michael used for extra buoyancy was found at sea. It was strong evidence that Michael had drowned, but at the same time, it offered a faint glimmer of hope. 5,000 natives began searching up and down the New Guinea coast, looking for any other trace of Michael. Nothing was found. After nearly two weeks, the search for Michael Rockefeller was ended. For an agonized father returning home, the official conclusion seemed unavoidable. Michael Rockefeller had drowned at sea. Yet it was not long before speculation began that perhaps somewhere in the jungle, Michael might still be alive. New York City, 1968. Seven years after Michael Rockefeller's disappearance, one man was led to begin a personal search for the missing Rockefeller. Milt Macklin, a writer and magazine editor, was met in his office by a secretive man who would call himself only Donahue. Donahue told Macklin that several months before, on a tiny island called Kanapu, he had seen and talked with Michael Rockefeller. Intrigued with the story, Macklin made plans to go to New Guinea. Macklin's information from Donahue was sketchy, but he had decided to follow the difficult route. According to Donahue's story, Rockefeller was picked up by a native war party and taken by canoe on a thousand mile journey to the Trobriand Islands. As Macklin made his way through the jungle, he began to understand Michael's attraction to its primitive beauty. After several days' travel, Macklin reached a major village of the Trobriands. A local chief knew of Kanapu Island and described its general location. It was a long journey by native standards, but at last Macklin's destination seemed within reach. By hired boat, Macklin sailed for Kanapu. Even on the best local charts, it was but a speck. Finally, the island appeared, like a vision from a storybook. After a long and tiring journey, Milt Macklin approached his destination with hopeful expectation. The island was a paradise, a beautiful tropical refuge. It was also an eerie place. There were few signs of life. A careful search led finally to a makeshift shelter. The hut was abandoned. There was no sign of Michael Rockefeller. Discouraged and disappointed, Milt Macklin gave up his Kanapu search. The fate of Michael Rockefeller remained a mystery. Yet for Macklin, the unsuccessful search had raised many questions. Was the Donahue story simply a cruel hoax, or did it bear some element of truth? Milt Macklin's determined search did not end on Kanapu Island. For two more months, he traveled throughout New Guinea, looking for evidence that might prove conclusively what happened to Michael Rockefeller. Macklin traced down endless leads, but his final personal conclusion was based on information from a Dutch missionary, Father Cornelis Van Kessel. Van Kessel had heard rumors from natives that Rockefeller was captured and killed near the Osmot village of Oats Janep, 
a war chief named Ajam was mentioned in the rumors as the man who might be responsible. Recently, the chief of Os Janep was interviewed. He recalled the search for Michael Rockefeller. There were many airplanes and boats. We were afraid and blocked our river with trees. Our enemies in the other villages all say that we killed him. They want us to get into trouble. I am the chief. If we killed him, I would know. The full and true story of Michael Rockefeller's disappearance may never be known. If the answer lies among the Osmot, a nearly impenetrable cultural curtain prevents a final solution. Yet in the life of the Osmot, the age-old rites that once preceded tribal violence can still be witnessed. After the mangrove ancestor poles are carved, an elaborate ceremony begins in honor of the dead. In the minds of the Osmot, life, art, magic, and death are inseparably interwoven, each continually affecting the other. Members of neighboring villages are ritually adopted by the celebrating tribe. Traditionally, however, they are the first to be killed when an intertribal feud arises. It is an accepted part in an ancient cycle of warfare and revenge. The ancestor ceremony climaxes when the poles are returned outside. In mock battle, the entire village dances around the symbolic poles. Only a generation ago, the ceremony would have led to a revenge attack on a rival tribe. But headhunting has been outlawed. An age-old way of Osmot life has been brought to an end. In his journal, Michael Rockefeller wrote, The Osmot is filled with a kind of tragedy. They were a ferocious head-hunting people, but now many villages are beginning to doubt the worth of their own culture. They crave things Western, even though these doubtful symbols of another world hide a proud form and replace a far finer, if less concealing, form of dress. Perhaps Michael Rockefeller's dedication to the Osmot was part of a larger personal quest for self-understanding and universal values which could guide him through life. I'd like to just say a word about Michael himself. Ever since he was little, he's been very aware of people, their feelings, their thoughts. He's a person who has always loved people and been loved by people. He had a tremendous enthusiasm and drive. Loved life. Has always loved beauty in people. Beauty in nature and beauty in art, whether it's painting or sculpture. And has been quite an artist himself. I think it's fair to say that he was never happier than he has been out there. Michael had one of the most exciting experiences of his life. The mystery of Michael Rockefeller's disappearance may never be solved, but his passion and spirit will live on in his pictorial record of the Osmot.
Before Michael Rockefeller traveled to New Guinea, he spoke of doing something romantic and adventurous at a time when frontiers, in the real sense of the word, were disappearing. Today, his tragic loss is underscored by the accelerating demise of the Osmot people and their culture. in New Guinea, Michael Rockefeller wrote, the West thinks in terms of bringing advance and opportunity to such a place. In actuality, we bring a cultural bankruptcy which will last for many years. Tenuously, the Osmot still hold on, among the last representatives of the beginning of humanity. Coming up next, 20th Century with Mike Wallace reports on the California Night Stalker and other serial killers. Then, Weapons at War looks at the evolution of bombs, rockets, and missiles. And log on at Veterans.com, a new website brought to you by the History Channel. Veterans.com, a place where veterans, their families, and others can connect, share stories, and pass on the legacies of all American veterans. <laughs>